All right, so for our next talk, we have Thomas, who's going to talk to us about paid path to production. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining. Today, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, how to design and build paved path to production on uh, Kubernetes. Um, I work at Systematic, a Danish software company. Uh, I'm a software engineer and cloud architect there. I'm really passionate about anything cloud native. I uh, wrote a book, it's called Cloud Native Spring in Action with Spring Boot and Kubernetes. And I'm a big supporter of open source technologies. I like contributing as much as I can. But before talking about technologies, I want to ask a question. And the question is, why do we build software? Now, I know that there might be different answers to this question, but we can agree perhaps that it's safe to say most of the times we build software uh, after we identified a problem. We identified a problem and we realized that it makes sense to solve it through software. So we start implementing a software-based solution to solve the problem and finally deliver value to users, to customers, and to the business. That's why we build software. We want to deliver value via software, and that software solves some problems. So the way that we deliver value, the way that we go from the initial idea to production, really matters. Because we start with this idea, at some point we involve a development team, we go through this path to production, which in our case would be Kubernetes today, but the way that we go there is really important in order to ensure that we get there uh, as quickly as possible, but also in a safe and secure way. Because until we reach production, then our software is useless. It's only when it's running in production that actually delivers value to users and customers. So for today, I want to explore how we can build such a path to production. And in particular, I'm gonna aim at achieving three main goals. The first goal is uh, a rapid and continuous feedback loop for developers, so as part of the de initial development workflow. Then the second goal is reducing the cognitive load. So I want to establish such a path to production, but I don't want to put too much burden on de uh, the development team. And finally, I want to establish a very clear and safe path to production. So these three will be our guiding principles for uh, the analysis that I'm gonna uh, run through uh, in this presentation. All right, we'll start with the development workflow. So we got the initial idea, we bootstrap a new project, uh, we build a new cloud native application, and depending on the language we are using, the runtime might change, but we know that in general, on top of that, we package our application as an executable and run it directly on top of this runtime. And this is a very uh, nice and clean experience. Uh, the feedback loop is quite fast. Just think about a Go application. Uh, it's very fast to compile it and run it while we are working through it, for example, for a web application. And the cognitive load is not that bad because we basically need to know just about the language and the framework that we are using for our application. But this is not enough. So we are aiming at deploying our applications in production on top of Kubernetes. So the next step here would be to containerize the application. And when we start introducing containers, then the runtime will be the container runtime, uh, like Podman or uh, Docker. And on top of that, we're gonna run the application packaged as a container. So just by doing that, uh, the feedback loop got a bit slower, because now we have this extra step of building a container image. And then we need to know how to build that container image in a way that is performant, in a way that is secure. So the cognitive load also get a bit worse. Now, uh, Docker files are a simple way to get started with containerizing applications. Writing a Docker file is very simple, but writing a Docker file that is production ready is really not that simple. And there are ways that we can uh, optimize and mitigate some of the issues that we encounter when we start working with containers. In particular, I'm aiming at not having developers being responsible for the Docker file, for the maintenance, for the security. And I really like a tool like Cloud Native Build Packs, a CNCF project to convert application source code into a container image without writing a Docker file. And the result is something that is production ready, so with all the security and the performance baked in. So as a developer, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of language or framework I'm using, because it's a polyglot tool. I can uh, run a command like pack build using the pack CLI provided by the build project, and then I obtain an image. 
So at least, even if I have this extra step of containerizing my application, the uh, cognitive load is not that bad because I can use cloud native build packs and I don't have to know all the details of writing a production ready Docker file. But that is not enough because we want to move to Kubernetes. So after building a container, uh, we still have the container runtime, but now we introduced a middleware. We have Kubernetes right there on top of which we run our application and things now start getting tricky because after building the container image, we now have to deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster. The feedback loop gets even slower. And then we need to know as developers about Kubernetes. And the cognitive load is quite bad there. But now, I want to specify two main things here. The first thing is, I'm assuming in these examples that we are using Kubernetes because we need Kubernetes. It means that we have the problems that Kubernetes solves. We don't want to add unnecessary complexity. So just because it's popular and everybody's talking about it, I still, I don't want to use Kubernetes if I don't have those problems. So that's the first assumption. I'm using it because I need it. But then I need to pay attention to not make a common mistake that is just throwing Kubernetes at the development team, because uh, that's the problem. Uh, when we have uh, Kubernetes like this, the feedback loop is bad, but the cognitive load, if we just tell the development team, okay, now you, you use Kubernetes, you have to learn all these cloud native tools, they're all amazing, they're great, I like working with them, but if I'm in a development team, I want to focus on the business logic of the application, and I don't want to spend too much time on all this extra complexity. So we need to manage that complexity somehow. And the trick is uh, to uh, give these capabilities to development teams, but without giving them also the responsibility. All the, the talking we, we do about uh, shifting left, that's, that should be about capabilities and not responsibilities. So um, once we have this uh, situation, we need to find a way first to assign responsibilities and then to uh, basically optimize the feedback loop, as we said, and reduce the cognitive load. Now, the cognitive load, I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a few seconds, but I want to start addressing the problem of this feedback loop, which now became slow after introducing this containerization step and Kubernetes step. And in particular, I can introduce a tool like Tilt or Scaffold in order to establish a continuous development uh, loop. Because it, as a developer, I start by making some code changes to my application, uh, then I build a container image, I run it on Kubernetes, then I do some testing, some debugging, and then all over again. Using a tool like Tilt, I can automate all these steps. I still have the same cognitive load because I still need uh, to know about Kubernetes and how to configure my workloads, but at least it's automated and it's fast. So let's have a look at an example. Now, I have a very simple Java application. It could be any other language. The approach is the same across different languages and frameworks. Uh, it's a very simple application with two endpoints. Since I'm using Tilt, as a developer, I can start my continuous development workflow just saying Tilt up. And then uh, Tilt will take care of uh, compiling my application, packaging it as a container image, uh, and then uh, deploying it on Kubernetes. And then since I'm using uh, cloud native build packs combined with Tilt, I can even establish a live reload cycle so that every time I make changes, uh, the uh, new files are automatically reloaded within the container rather than having to build a new container image every time. So this is uh, a combination of what Tilt can do and what cloud native build packs support. So um, we even have a a GUI for Tilt. We can see that for this application, the book service is started by using cloud native build packs. I'm using the Paketo build packs to build a new container image. After that, it will uh, deploy the application using some manifest that I have to provide. So as I said, the cognitive load is still not that good. I need to provide a deployment object uh, to tell Kubernetes how to deploy my application. I need a service object saying how to expose my application within the cluster, and then I need an ingress object in order to expose the application outside the cluster. This all works, but again, as a developer, if I put this manifest, even if they are auto-generated, but if they are part of my application source code, then it means I'm responsible for it. 
the same thing for the Docker file. So we can use tools in order to not having to write all these uh, manifests manually, but if they lie with, together with the, the application source code, we don't really have a separation of concerns. It means developers need to know about Kubernetes and need to maintain these files. And I'd, li I'd like to get rid of that from the developer. So we can see the application is deployed, is exposed through port 8080, it's running. Welcome to book service. Let's verify the other endpoint, books. So I get a bunch of books. And all of this is configured via a tilt file. So I'm pointing tilt to my uh, deployment manifest. I'm telling tilt to expose my application through port 8080. And then I'm telling tilt to use cloud native build packs to containerize my application. Now I can use the pack CLI, which works across different languages and frameworks. Since I'm using Java Spring Boot, uh, Cloud Native Build Packs is part of the Spring Boot framework, so I can use it directly without having to install a separate CLI, which is quite convenient. All right. So this is our situation now after introducing containers and Kubernetes. So let's have a look at our initial goals. All right. So we saw that using Tilt, we can automate a lot of steps and still ensure a rapid and continuous feedback loop check. That is still good, but the cognitive load is still not uh, that good. It's too much. So Cloud Native Build Packs is great, but if I ran it from uh, my application source code directly, then I still have some responsibility as a developer. For example, what is the base image used? What happens when a new vulnerability is discovered? Like there's an open SSL vulnerability in the base image on Ubuntu, what to do? Uh, and then we have all this Kubernetes manifest that is too much. So I think developers should know a bit about Kubernetes because that's the runtime environment. So to know, knowing the constraints of the environment where we are deploying applications is important. But that doesn't mean being expert in writing the perfect manifest that can uh, support and have all the different security uh, considerations and policy assurance and all of that that we really need in a production scenario. And then I still don't see a safe path to production. These actions, I will perform them also as part of my CI CD pipeline, but how are those actions related to what I do in my development environment? We'll find out soon because if we look at uh, CI CD pipelines now, I have done my work as a developer. I pushed the changes to Git. We have a simple pipeline as an example. Uh, every time I push new changes, my pipeline will check out the source code, will uh, uh, build a container image, will configure the workload, and finally deploy it. And now the standard way of implementing such a pipeline is using an orchestrator. So for example, GitHub Actions, uh, GitLab CI, uh, Jenkins, Tecton. And that works in a lot of different cases, like this is the approach. Uh, I call it an imperative pipeline. It's the approach that I use in most of my GitHub projects, for example. But when we start introducing Kubernetes, especially uh, within organizations with multiple development teams, then we start noticing that this pattern, this approach, has some drawbacks, because it's a quite rigid system. Meaning that if I want to make changes to how I build a container image in isolation, I can't do that because it's very tightly coupled. It's, uh, uh, the definition belongs to, with the application source code, so I don't have a clear separation of concerns. If I have uh, some security experts in my organizations that want to provide certain policies to my workloads as part of the configuration step, it's hard for them to do that if the pipeline is uh, one single rigid system and lives with the application source code. And in general, it's hard to maintain. So of course, this is a very specific scenario where we are using Kubernetes. We have multiple development teams. What can we do to improve the situation? How can we solve these issues? The problem is that we need to consider not only developers, but all these other personas that uh, still have, uh, need a way to provide their skills and expertise to the system. Earlier, I talked about developers, but in the path to production, we need to consider other personas like application operators, security experts, um, platform engineers. We need a way to clearly define the boundaries between all these personas, between different teams, 
so that each team then can be specialized in what they're doing. In a development team, I expect developers to really focus on the business logic part, that is what provides value to the end users, but not necessarily about how to containerize an image or how to configure a workload for production with all the security and performance and compliance that we need in a production environment. And this is even more important in uh, highly regulated industries. So, we have a pipeline, an imperative pipeline. What can we do to solve those problems? We can try to look at how we uh, build applications. If we have a single rigid application and we have the need to change independently some components, some areas of it, and have different teams being responsible for different components, what do we do? We break the monolith down. So let's try to extract the deploy workload functionality outside and say that now the first part of the pipeline will output some uh, Kubernetes manifest, perhaps pushing them in a Git repository. And then the deploy workload component will uh, watch the Git repository, and every time they change, then it will fetch those new manifests and deploy them. And look at that. That's what we do with GitOps, right? So what if we extend this GitOps, uh, yeah, with the, this GitOps approach to the entire pipeline? This is an event-based system, right? So let's try and move out configure workloads. Now every time a new image is built, configure workloads is triggered and will uh, configure new workloads with the new image reference, for example. And we can do the same for all the steps that we need to be independent from each other. In the first case, there we have the source code. Every time it changes, we build a new container image. This is a reactive system. And if uh, we consider the reactive manifesto, a reactive system, among the other things, is message driven. So we just turned the original imperative pipeline into an event driven system where each of these components is independent from each other. They don't know about each other. They just know about inputs and outputs, which is quite convenient because uh, it's, uh, everything is loosely coupled. I have a clear separation of concerns. If my security team want to change something uh, about how we configure the workloads, they can do that. And they won't have to trigger the entire pipeline from the beginning, and they won't have to coordinate with all the development teams. We get uh, a flexible system. Since it's event-based, we can swap uh, each of these components with something else, maybe different implementations. We can add new components, remove components, without affecting the rest, which is quite convenient. And this is a key uh, aspect to build this consistent path to production. But we changed the architecture of the pipeline, but we introduced two, two new problems now, because the API up there for uh, towards developers now uh, needs to be different. So we need to find a way to uh, interface the developers with this new way of building a pipeline. And then we need a way to pass messages around. Just said it's a message-driven system. So how do we make sure that we pass these messages between components? The solution I'm presenting today is based on a, a project. It's called Cartographer. And Cartographer is defined as a Kubernetes native choreographer. Once again, if we consider how we build applications, in particular event-driven systems, uh, we have the choreography pattern there that we can use in order to uh, define how to exchange messages between microservices, for example. So we can use the same approach here. Now, the way I like to define Cartographer, besides like the official definition, is as a framework to build paved path to production. So we have two challenges, right? Two new challenges in this uh, setup. The first, I said, is the API towards developer. And Cartographer offers the workload API. Think about it. As a developer, if I'm working with a new application, there's a set of information that only I, as a, the developer, know, like the name of the application, the Git repository where my application is, the branch, and maybe some additional metadata like what language I'm using or what type of application is. That's it. So the workload API allows me to provide exactly that information. I can provide the name of the application, the type, for example, it's a web application, the Git repository where I have my application, and the branch. So as a developer now, instead of dealing directly with cloud native build packs with uh, Kubernetes manifest and deployment configuration, I just use the workload API to submit my request to a platform that will use Cartographer then to trigger my reactive pipeline. So 
I'm now in a different situation. I have a platform team that provided the platform to me as a developer in a product team. And I have a workload configuration now, so I won't have any more the deployment, ingress, service. I don't have any of that. I just have a workload. And I can apply directly to the cluster with the Kubernetes CLI, but I can still use Tilt. So my experience won't change that much. I can say Tilt up. But now Tilt, instead of uh, uh, running the containerization process and deployment process, will just submit this workload resource uh, to the cluster. And then Cartographer takes care of the rest. We can see here we have a reference to my repository at the subpath also, because it's in a subdirectory. And if we look at uh, the Tilt GUI, we can see that the application is up and running. It's uh, still forwarded uh, through port 8080. And I still have the live reload capabilities. So I didn't miss any of the nice features that I had at the beginning. But now, the way that is containerized or the way that is deployed, it's uh, out of my hands as a developer. It's provided by the platform to me. So I can focus on the business logic. And next, the other side, so the side that will be more interesting for application operators or platform engineers, is what happens when we send a request via the workload API. So how can Cartographer pass messages around all these components? It does that by intercepting inputs and outputs. Basically, it wraps all of these components, so the components will know nothing about Cartographer, and Cartographer doesn't need to know how they are implemented. It's quite flexible in that sense. So I can say that I want to use Flux CD for watching the source code. I can use Tecton to build a testing pipeline for my application. I can use Cloud Native Build Packs to build a container image, in particular KPack, which is the Kubernetes native implementation of Build Packs. I can use Knative uh, to define my workload configuration, and then I can use Carvel for doing the deployments. But again, this is flexible, right? One of the points was being able to change parts of this uh, pipeline independently without breaking the rest or affecting the rest. So perhaps I'm working in a team where I already have Jenkins for my testing pipeline. That's fine. I can replace Jenkins with Tecton. As long as the inputs and outputs are the same, uh, I can uh, change the implementation, and Cartographer doesn't need to know about that, and all the other components will not be affected. So it's all based on, the con on contracts, like in an event-driven system. What matters is inputs and outputs. I can use Argo instead of Flux. I can use Canico if I want to work with Docker files instead of build packs, uh, or even with plain Kubernetes manifest if Knative doesn't fit my use case. That's fine. I can do that because being an event-driven system, as long as I keep the contract, uh, I can swap all these components with different implementations. And really, like, sky's the limit, right? So, uh, Cartographer can integrate potentially with any, any tool as long as we have the same input and output. And this is great because every organization, every team will have different needs, right? So we always need to consider what are the user requirements before implementing these things. And having this kind of flexibility really helps ensuring the best experience for the end users of the platform. Nice. So uh, another important part is how Cartographer can do that. How can Cartographer know how to pass uh, the output of a component as input to another component? He does that via the concept of a supply chain. The supply chain is basically the way we use in Cartographer to describe the path to production. Now, this is a simple example. I define a supply chain that handles all the workloads of type web. So this is a key part. Like, I don't have a one-to-one -one mapping between application and uh, a pipeline. But I can reuse and centralize my supply chain and use it across multiple teams and application. And I have three components here. The first component uh, checks out the source code. The second component uses that output as input to build the image. And the third component uh, gets the image and then deploys it to the cluster. And you can see there's nothing about Flux or BuildPux or Knative here. The way that we uh, do that integration is via a third API. So we talked about workload API, supply chain API, and finally at the low level we have the template API. For example, uh, Flux CD 
we could use it to check out the source code. Fluxd provides a Git repository object where we can specify the Git repository name and branch. But that information is provided by developers via the workload API already. So we can ask Cartographer to provide that information dynamically because we already have it. And then we need to specify how to get the output from Flux. This would be different depending on the implementation. So we use the concept of the template where we specify uh, the output based on the type of uh, the output itself. In this case, the output is source code. So the output will be URL and revision path. In the case of an image, it will be uh, an image reference and we're gonna uh, use a cluster image template. So we have a few different template types based on the type of the outputs. Then finally, we can put all of these things together because we uh, looked at the developer experience. Once I'm done, uh, I push my changes. And then uh, in a different cluster where I have all these uh, build capabilities, I uh, can look, moving here, so I can look at the workload for book service and see that every time that I uh, push my changes, Let's adjust the size here. Yeah, so this is the supply chain applied to my application. I have a few different components. I'm using Fluxd to check out the source code. I'm using Tekton to run a testing pipeline. I'm using Trivi to scan my source code and image uh, uh, orchestrated by Tekton again. I'm using KPAC for building images. Uh, Trivi within Tekton to scan my image. I apply conventions, configuration, and finally, either I push my uh, workload manifest directly to a, a repository or I open a pull request. And in this case, I open the pull request. So let's check the uh, repository here. I get a pull request from Cartographer. We can see that we get a new image reference. So if I merge the pull request, that will trigger a new change in my production environment. Pull request merged. Let's go to the production cluster. I am using Knative, so if we check at the Knative services here, I get the URL for the application. And you can see that it's using HTTPS. It's based on Cert Manager with uh, Knative and Let's Encrypt. So it's uh, producing a production-ready certificate for that. And there it is. Welcome to Book Service. So this was the entire supply chain. But we are missing one final part, because I started by having already the project opened in my IDE. But I still need to provide the workload uh, configuration manifest myself, and I have to provide the configuration for Tilt. So rather than doing it manually, I can even further improve the developer experience. And if I'm using something like uh, Backstage, I can provide uh, this uh, bootstrapping capability through a developer portal. So I can, uh, if I want to create an application similar to my example with Spring Boot, I choose the specific uh, uh, template that is part of a golden path. Um, so I can have demo backstage uh, as a name. Uh, I'm, let's say I'm in team B. I want to create a repository. And let's name it demo backstage. So I can automate even the bootstrapping phase so that developers don't even need to uh, worry about how to create that workload configuration. I get a repository. And you can see I get a new repo in GitHub. And the important part is that I get the workload configuration with uh, uh, my application name. And I get the tilt file with tilt configured. So as a developer, I check out the source code from uh, GitHub. And then in my development cluster, I can just say tilt up, and that's it. I can start working on my business logic. So to sum up, uh, we can support multiple developer, uh, development teams working with different languages and frameworks. It doesn't matter, because through the workload API, they can take advantage of the same supply chain. And that supply chain ultimately will make sure that uh, the applications are deployed in production, which is 
the whole point of this, right? We want to go to production uh, quickly, but also safely and securely. And since we are working with this uh, supply chain abstraction, we can have all those different personas like operators, uh, platform engineers, and security experts providing their skills, their expertise into the supply chain to ensure policy uh, compliance and security and any other aspect that we might want to enforce, enforce as part of our delivery process within our organization. Yeah, so continuous feedback loop is still rapid, still same experience with Tilt, but now we got reduced cognitive load. I can bootstrap a new project. Uh, I only need to know about this workload API, but that information I know as a developer, like it's the Git repo and the name and the type, that's fine. And I also get a clear and safe path to production because I don't have to worry about building new pipelines every time I create a new project because the platform using Cartographer provides that functionality for me. So that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, all the source code is on GitHub. Uh, you can see like the platform that uh, I've been using and the Cartographer configuration is there, examples of applications and other useful content. Um, thank you very much for joining and uh, have a great rest of the day.